the precision of scripture, the historical records, and the physical geography of the area all coming together and creating a picture that this is the most likely site of the crossing point. The Bible says that they crossed through the Red Sea, and it was the mighty waters of the Red Sea. That's simple. We need to look there. The Bible says that Mount Sinai is in Arabia. Galatians 4.25 says now Hagar stands for Mount Sinai in Arabia. The Bible says it's in the ancient land of Midian, where Moses met God on Mount Sinai. Why aren't we following the clues given us in Scripture? The Bible is like a road map. It's like a compass that you can open up and follow these clues. For about 600 years at least, we have records of people saying that Mount Sinai should be in Saudi Arabia. Now Josephus around 90 AD makes this claim. Well, this designation that Josephus is talking about is not in the Sinai Peninsula, but in Arabia, which would be, according to our calculations, on a mountain called Jabal al -Laws. The Bible says, when God is speaking to Moses, you shall return to Egypt and come back and serve God on this mountain, meaning that he needs to come back to Midian, which is not in Egypt. Tradition is a powerful thing. And once you start fooling with tradition, even if it's legitimate evidence, it is very, very difficult for people to let go of that. Without the official invitation from a Saudi citizen, obtaining entry visas proves to be impossible. Well, it is difficult to get into Saudi Arabia. You just don't go there. We had to manufacture a way to get into the country. I was warned by Jim Irwin that this would be very dangerous. And he gave me the illustration of when he was going to the moon, they shut the door. He said it was like a dungeon door closing. He said at that moment, there was no turning back. You are going. And the chances of death are there. And I knew that going. Another friend that I met, a, a Greek fellow, said, well, I think I know how to get you in, Larry. Uh, I have a letter from the king of Saudi Arabia, and we'll take his signature, and we'll put it on his uh, letterhead, which I have, and we'll change the fax machine on my fax to read his fax number, and we'll put the time at the time in Riyadh, and we're going to fax this letter to the embassy here in London. And it basically the letter is going to say, this is from the king, and I want these guys in and in a hurry. Get them in. So we faxed it to the Saudi embassy about, I don't know, maybe eight blocks away. And uh, sure enough, we got in in a real quick time period. The king carries a lot of weight. Bob was more than uncomfortable with it. Uh, it bothered him a great deal. I think to this day it probably still does. Bob and I come from two different views on this. Um, he has a lot stronger religious beliefs and feelings than I do about things. And I'm kind of like oh, the doubting Thomas of all this stuff. And to me, it was just a question of how do you get in. When they closed that door on that Saudi airliner, we were going. And there was no turning back. Getting into Saudi Arabia is one thing. Finding the mountain is another. Using the letter given to them by Jim Irwin, Cornuke and Williams drive out into the vast Saudi desert, hoping luck will follow. Well, the desert over there is just an ex a huge expanse and just an almost an endless sea of sand and rock. And the heat is so hot that it just sucks the air right out of your lungs. It, it's frightening to even breathe that 128 degree heat. The only problem was with David's description was take a right at a big rock and then go 0.6 kilometers and take a left at another big rock. The desert's really easy to get lost in. With a limited water supply and maps that are now essentially useless, Bob and Larry become hopelessly lost when suddenly a band of Bedouin desert dwellers come to their aid. Here we're sitting there and we're saying, do you know where Jabal El Oz is? He walked out just to the edge of this hill, so the hill hiding us and pointed. Jabal Allah's Jabal Musa. Bob and Larry get their first look at the mysterious peak. Could this be the holy mountain of God spoken of in the Old Testament? Jabal Musa, which I knew clearly was Arabic for the mountain of Moses. 
he clearly knew this there as Moses's mountain. It's such an interesting mountain. When you see Jabal al Allah from a distance, you think, that my first impression, uh, there must be a cloud up there, there's a shadow over it, because the corner of the top, kind of a triangular part, is black. We know the Bible says that God descended on the mountain in flames of a furnace. So for me, it was a, kind of a surreal moment. As they move closer to the mountain, they are confronted with a harsh reality. Warning signs posted in both Arabic and English, and impenetrable high barbed wire fences surrounding the base of the mountain. Aware now of the fact that they could be spotted at any moment, the two move ahead cautiously, looking for any evidence they can find. What they find next will leave them breathless. I'm looking for markings and paintings and little etchings around the mountain. And I kind of walked upon it. Come on over here, come on over here. I'm looking for a little something a little like this. And I looked up and I saw this huge rock monolith. This is actual video footage of their remarkable find smuggled out of Saudi Arabia at great risk. Well, the altar is obviously man-made. It's immense. It would have taken hundreds of men or thousands of men to erect. And so this wasn't a band of nomads that erected this. And this altar site is out in the middle of a huge, flat, arid field. There's no rocks close to it at all. I mean, it, it stands all by itself, right, Bob? There's, there's nothing close to it. So the rocks didn't just grow there. They came from some place. Bob and Larry move in closer to examine mysterious petroglyphs on the side of the altar, instantly recognizing their similarity to the ancient Egyptian deities, Apis and Hathor. I figured that if, if this was Mount Sinai, this had to be the altar where they made the golden calf. Why would you put a fence around a random rock pile? They wouldn't. They know that this has great importance. They've erected a fence with barbed wire to keep people away. Under the constant threat of being spotted by patrolling guards, the two agree they have precious little time to explore further around the base of the mountain. Uh, we're able to notice what I call boundary markers. If you study this closely, you'll see these big piles of rock, or oh, maybe four and a half feet tall, three and a half feet tall maybe six feet in diameter, and they're clearly around the mountain. The mountain was considered to be so holy that if the people just touched it, they would die. So Moses was told to put boundary markers around the mountain to keep the people away. And sure enough, around this mountain, about every 400 yards, there are these rock piles. And why would you put these huge rock piles in precise, linear fashion around the mountain? After a few hours of restless sleep, Bob and Larry decide it is time to climb Jebel al -Az. And we crested the top of the knoll, and we're welcomed by an incredible sunrise. The sunrise is just awe-inspiring. But when we get up there, the rocks are clearly black, just like a chalkboard black on the outside. And you break the rocks open, and they're not black on the inside. And then as you come down the mountain, there's no more blackened rocks. Some maps will show that they're vulcanized rock. It came from a volcanic eruption. But when we lifted these rocks up, and Larry and I were smashing them on top of the mountain, and they'd break open, and you'd have this almost pinkish brown granite that would be exposed when you broke the rocks open, we realized then that, of course, they're not volcanic. But what are they? And based on all the other evidence, it started to mount, uh, like a police investigator, the degrees of probability increased, and our excitement started to increase also. What went through my mind was watching the experience Bob was having. He pulled out his Bible and started to write something in his Bible, and yeah, I know Bob went through a lot of on top of Chapel Allah. We thought that we might be standing on holy ground. I mean, just think about the significance of Sinai. It was a moment for me. The Bible became vibrantly real at that moment. To think that I could be standing where Moses was told to take off his sandals. And I looked down and I said, hmm.